Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Let's uh, if you could get seated. So, for those of you who weren't here this morning, the format that we're running is that for each of the panels you'll hear from this afternoon, we're asking for folks to give a brief presentation. Um, actually in response to three questions which were put to them. There'll then be clarifying questions from the panel um, that are focused with each of the presenters, but we'll try and get through the formal presentations very quickly, and then most of the session will be devoted to discussion. So this panel three is on protecting, restoring, and enhancing the Delta ecosystem and its challenges. It's divided into two parts. The first part is hydrodynamics, water quality, salinity, nutrients, and food web. And uh, so for the four economists that had to field some of these questions this morning, um, we'll, we'll have the experts here. So the first presenter will be uh, on hydrodynamics uh, and uh, John Bureau with the USGS. Before we get into that, uh, just to plan the final session, for those of you who wish to make public comment at the end, uh, outside you'll see there are blue slips, and if you could fill those out and get them to Maggie so we can at least uh, plan that half-hour session. So, John, welcome and thank you. Thank you. Eight minutes. It's going to be a world record for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not it. 3.1. So, um, uh -oh. so um, this is a tough thing in eight minutes to talk about any of these topics, and uh, well, this, this is way down here. So um, I thought I would go really, really high level and talk about our central challenge was is to really get the correct view of how the estuary is functioning, and that means collecting data. I happen to collect hydrodynamic and water quality data on which to base our decisions, and, and hydrodynamics have a lot about a lot to do about how we can how we collect data correctly, and so, from my perspective, the one of the central challenges is for collecting data so we have a decision support system that can tell us what happened, and we're actually fairly decent at telling about what happened, but we've had we've struggled and are having uh, I think uh, challenges with regard to uh, collecting data and doing analysis to figure out why things happen. It's usually a lot more expensive, and it, it's a it's a challenge now, and it will certainly be a challenge when we start. Uh, implementing BDCP if that comes about. Right. So, what are hydrodynamics? Big picture. And I want you to notice the, uh, the, the, the scale of the, uh, the text there. And um, we do have river flows, the red, red arrows, we have exports, the blue arrows, and we have this big thing, the tides. And uh, one of the more important things, at least when you're thinking about delta scale things, I mean, obviously all of those little uh, landscape tides, river flows, and exports are very important locally and, and regionally. But when you think about the entire delta, um, interestingly enough, the landscape is probably one of the biggest things that uh, can, can change the hydrodynamics. So when we talk about the BDCP and other things, um, uh, I, I would argue that in particular, if, if, if uh, a lot of this restoration occurs, that that will have a larger impact overall on the delta than, than exports and tunnels and those kind of things. So um, that's what hydrodynamics are. So when we, we, we talk to SFEI folks about uh, historical landscape versus now, because it's in bold here, that's a big deal. Uh, the delta uh, hydrodynamically was incredibly different now than it is uh, than it was back in the day. So um, here's the two things that hydrodynamics do that makes it difficult for us to figure out what's going on. The first thing it does is it interconnects aquatic landscapes over uh, local, regional, and uh, larger uh, time scales. And then the other thing is it, is it really messes us up. Um, stuff moves all over the place, the tides are really important, and so there's a lot of high frequency variability in almost everything we can collect. 
And what we're most interested usually in is long-term trends, how things are happening, you know, at, at, at longer-term timescales. But this high-frequency stuff always gets in the way, and it's a big challenge. So um, I'm going to give an example about what I mean uh, with regard to regional, how, how, how um, you know, a small change or a relatively small change in one place can, um, can change uh, the regional hygienic dynamics. And so when we talk about doing restoration, um, the, the thing that people may want to do is just kind of study right around that circle, and that happens to be Prospect Island. Um, but what we're learning and from our models and other things is that when you do something like restore Prospect Island and some of the other things that are being proposed, it affects uh, things regionally. So there's Prospect Island. I'm not going to go into details. I only have eight minutes. But what I did, um, and I've done by looking at some of the model results, is kind of look at a variety of things that, that can happen when you, when you do a restoration here or other places. And so I went through this thought experiment, and the point I want to make is that uh, when you open this up, it's going to increase the tidal energy, and you can go through all kinds of different things to, to uh, think about how it might change, excuse me, um, water quality. Um, so you can go through this thought experiment, and there's model results to, to, um, to verify this, but so I've done something in Prospect Island. What I want to point out is it probably will affect water quality. Um, if it does that, in order for them to maintain salinity standards, they have to either release more water or decrease exports. So here I am. I've done my little uh, Prospect Island thing, which actually isn't that little. Um, but I've affected everything from uh, salt transport to, to exports. And so uh, when we think about uh, collecting data and analyzing it, we can't just look at Prospect Island when we do our research. It's going to, you know, we have to... Um, look at how it affects everything, and so that is something that is very, very challenging. So I just went through several different thought experiments, water deliveries. If, if we do Prospect Island, we may be able to take more water out of the isolated facility, depending on how they set up the rules. Um, you can look at salmon out migration. I have about half a dozen of these where, um, you know, a simple restoration area uh, uh, in one place can affect uh, the hydrodynamics everywhere. And so when we think about trying to figure out the impacts of the things that are going on and the things that we plan to do, um, we can't just say, hey, let's just, let's just sample right around Prospect Island and see what the impacts are. And then, of course, the real challenge is when you do Prospect Island, something in Liberty Island, you put it in the isolated facility or do whatever, or a levee fails, trying to figure out um, how, the, how the ecosystem is functioning when all of those things are happening is very challenging because, again, my topic, hydrodynamics tends to, um, you know, uh, pro propagate things that are done at a local scale to a regional scale. So the good news, uh, that's kind of the, the bad news, is that we have to do things on the landscape scale even when we do small scale uh, modifications. The good news is that on the hydrodynamic side of things, we're, we're actually the physical side of things, and, and Greg will talk about this more, we're doing pretty well. So all those little red dots are places where we sample. And you might say, good God, that's a lot of sampling. But the reason that you want to do a lot of that sampling is because, well, for one thing, you never know where a levee's going to break. Or we really don't, and we haven't really uh, certified where we're going to do um, restoration. And so um, do things on the landscape sale so that when you do things like up in, in, in Prospect Island, you can actually understand how those changes propagate through the system. The other thing that's really good about the physical side of things um, is that uh, numerical models actually have really evolved over the last 20 years, and we do have some predictive capabilities on the big picture uh, physical things. So, uh, but what have we learned from this, this high-frequency data collection? And I've worked with Wim uh, Kimmerer, Jim Klorn, and when we can sample at high-frequency ecological variables, we find that there's all kinds of variability, uh, high-frequency variability that we need to take into account. So the, the problem with that is, is that we really can't collect some of these things at high frequency. And so we've got to figure out how to be clever about it. And I don't know that we figured out how to do that. So as I said on the physical side of things, um, the sensors are great. They run. We can telemeter. We can collect data in 15 minutes. But uh, the biological data is hard. And this is going to be a big challenge for us when we start doing BDCP things is that, you know, that happens to be a Kodiak draw. We really want to know how things are affecting the upper, upper trophic levels. But sampling at landscape scale and sampling at the right frequencies to be able to figure out the impacts of what we're doing is going to be very challenging. So one of the things I've learned um, by, by scaling up our, our physical monitoring, we went from 10 stations to, to 40. Okay? 
We do things completely differently now than we did when we did 10 stations. When you scale up, that's an entirely different problem. For example, we've learned how to, we, we know how to uh, build lithium batteries forever, but there's a guy out there, Elon Musk, that's gonna try and do it at scale. That problem itself is very difficult. So for us to be able to collect data to, uh, for example, uh, understand some of the PDCP actions, we've gotta scale up our ecological and biological sam sampling, and that's gonna be challenging, and I think that's something we need to work on now. So um, from my perspective, because I uh, work on hydrodynamics, um, we really need to, to get this decision support system on the ecosystem biological side of our sampling house so we can figure out what happened and why. And it's because of the hydrodynamics that we need to do it at, uh, if, if we can, at the highest frequencies we can afford and over regional scales. That's it. Well, thank you, John. That must be a first. So first of all, <laughs> <laughs> is that eight minutes, really? Yeah, it was pretty good. I'm yeah, done. So, so, uh, f f from the panel members, do you have any clarifying questions of John? No? That's great. Thanks, John. Our next <coughs> presenter on salinity and diversions is going to be Dr. Greg Gartrell, um, recently of the Contra Costa Water District, and via France. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> so, good afternoon. Um, I ran across uh, this quote from H.L. Mencken, actually, in a book I'm reading on quantum field theory. But, uh, I liked it so much I thought it would be quite appropriate here. And, uh, unfortunately, I think he got one thing wrong, uh, which is that there, that uh, clear, simple, and wrong answer is not unique. There are lots of them. Um, and that's the trouble we uh, continue to find ourselves in, in uh, the situation that we have right now. Uh, as, as John was saying, and I, and I agree, uh, hydrodynamics and salinity movement, uh, dispersion, are things that we understand quite well. Uh, fluid mechanics, anybody who's studied fluid mechanics knows that the, uh, the standard fluids that we normally work with are called Newtonian fluids. Uh, so it gives you an idea just how, how long people have been studying fluid mechanics and how well uh, we've come forward with that. Um, we're very good right now at the local measurements that uh, John gave you an idea of just how much we do that. That's all in an Eulerian sense. Uh, I find that people have uh, trouble uh, going back and forth from Eulerian measurements to figuring out what's going on in Lagrangian sense. And a Lagrangian sense is really what you need to know for a lot of the, the problems, particularly how uh, fish and other things that are moving. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the best models on uh, salinity are, are, are generally uh, Lagrangian in this kind of system. Um, <clears throat> modeling flows, water stage, and given inflows, uh, diversions and tides, we're very good at that. Modeling salinity transport for given flow conditions, we're very good at that. Um, some things we could do, but we don't, uh, that are important. Uh, we, we're very poor at measuring local diversions. Uh, there, there are a lot of them in the delta, there are a lot of them upstream. Uh, if uh, you keep track of what people like uh, John Lehigh have to deal with every day in the summer is releasing water from a dam upstream and then not having it show up in the delta and not knowing why. Um, uh, we've looked at some of those reasons and they're, they're not just simple reasons, there's a, a lot of things going on. Um, but when you get into the delta as well, uh, very few diversions are measured and fewer, even fewer are reported in real time. Discharge volumes and uh, quality, uh, uh, POTWs are measured, uh, not necessarily reported to the agencies that you have to even get the data easily and, and translate into models, but it's available. But the, the vast majority of the discharges coming off Delta Islands uh, are not measured uh, in terms of volume or in quality. Those all affect uh, local salinity uh, issues and uh, pollution issues uh, and make it very, very difficult to determine what's going on. Those are things we could do, and, but don't. And the other things, uh, there are things like wind shear, atmospheric pressure, the temperature changes uh, are needed to be tracked uh, and to improve models or modeling of past uh, uh, situations. We don't do a real good job of keeping track of all those. Some things we can't do. Um, one of them is predict the effects of uh, sea level rise, uh, for example, on salinity. Um, I hate to contradict a, a previous statement by one of the panelists, but it's wrong to say that, um, boy, sea level is going to make salinity rise without knowing 
what the response to that is. And I'll give you an example. Um, just today, uh, you could, I could flood certain areas in the delta and make salinity go down, and other areas in the delta and make salinity go up. It just depends on, on some complex uh, hydrodynamics that generally have to do with the phase. For example, in the western delta, islands uh, flood in the western delta, those are close enough to be in phase with the, with the flood tide uh, coming through the Carquina Strait that they will enhance the amount of flow coming in. Whereas if you get up near uh, in, into the northern part of the delta or the eastern or southern, uh, you're out of phase. Sacramento, for example, compared to, to uh, the Golden Gate is about seven to nine hours out of phase, depending on the higher or low tide with the Golden Gate. So it's rising when the Golden Gate's going down. You know, it's completely out. And that can uh, have the, the opposite effect if you have one area that's, that's uh, ebbing while another area is flooding, uh, reduce uh, salinity entrainment. The problem with on, on, on sea level rise is it's so complex you can't even bookend it. You can, you can bookend the actions. You can say, in one case, uh, we'll look at, we do nothing. In Alameda floods, uh, the Embarcadero floods, you got water at high tide in the ferry building. Um, new areas flood area, that, that's one action bookend. Another action bookend is we do everything and we don't let one square centimeter flood that's not flooded now. Just build a wall around everything. You're gonna have two different uh, answers to that, but that doesn't bookend the salinity response. You only get a bookend on the salinity response if your system is kind enough to have a well-behaved function in between those two points and it isn't. Uh, there's no guarantee that it's monotonic, for example. There's no guarantee that there are maxima and minima, and like I said before, depending on what areas you flood or don't flood. Uh, a recent paper by uh, Mark Stacy's group uh, at Berkeley demonstrated that uh, by comparing uh, the do-everything scenario, don't let anything new flood with areas, allowing areas to flood, you have vastly different uh, levels of the tidal amplitude that result. And when you have a different level of tidal amplitude, of course, you're going to have different flows and different dispersion and different uh, salinity. And in fact, it's, it's, uh, some of their work is showing that uh, if you do something in the North Bay uh, around San Pablo Bay and don't allow areas to flood there, you can make things dramatically worse in the South Bay and flood areas there that wouldn't otherwise. You can imagine what those EIRs are going to look like when people don't work together on, uh, on a uh, system-wide response. Uh, and again, and the other one is pl predicting climate change. You saw some of the, the uh, results earlier. The way we look at that or the way it's looked at is lots of different models, and then you kind of average them and, and hope that uh, they're not, they don't all have the systematic, the same systematic errors. Um, you can get ideas, and generally, like there'll be more rain, less snow, uh, more severe in wet, dry periods, but it's not real good at predicting. It's, it's nowhere near like the advances we've had in weather prediction. Where have we gone to from 25 years ago where it was hard, uh, hard to predict two or three days in advance, and now we're all the way out to six or seven days. Uh, and uh, if you've read uh, Nate Silver's book on uh, signal and the noise, you, you might recall his uh, analysis that showed that if you want to go eight or nine days, get a farmer's albanac. <laughs> it's more accurate than the, uh, the models. There are a lot of reasons for that, uh, and, it's, and that's far more complex than the kind of system we're trying to model. That has a lot of feedback in it that uh, creates that complexity. Some of the uh, examples of complexity, salinity flow relationships uh, change with time, but not always in the same direction in the same place because of factors that, that John mentioned where you can have changes in the bathymetry. Um, measuring mean flow is uh, extremely difficult, and uh, the outflow is a very, very important quantity but we can't check the measurements we have with uh, a second method because we don't have all the internal measurements of all the things that are going on. Uh, and, and as you already mentioned, the habitat restorations can, can have profound effects depending on how they're done and where they're done. Uh, and you still, you, need, you can use the complex modeling to understand them, but you still need some sort of field verification uh, to ensure that you haven't left something out. So what that adds up to is that we have a general idea of what affects flows and how salt and other uh, dissolved or passive conservative pollutants will move. We can do that quite well, provided that we uh, have accurate input data, which we don't have, and we can estimate certain factors, and that our forecast abilities are better than most, but still not adequate is what needed for 
uh, really developing what's going to go on in the future and, and how we're going to be, be able to react to that. And that uh, concludes what I had to say. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Any clarifying questions from the panel at this stage? Thank you. That was very clear. So our next presenter uh, is going to be on the general topic of nutrients and food web, and uh, Dr. Jim Clem from the USGS. Well, I'm going to start with an apology. I didn't do my assignment. I'm not going to talk about nutrients and food. Um, I thought it might be more interesting to talk about the problem of why the Delta problem is so high. And um, so I want to begin with, and I'm not going to tell you all anything that you don't know. This is just going to be a talk of reminders. So one of the things I want to remind you of is that we have solved some environmental problems. And um, here's an example. Uh, this graph here shows oxygen concentrations in the lower part of San Francisco Bay in the 1950s and 1960s. So in that era, the lower South Bay was anoxic every, every summer. And these are data from, from Sam Luoma showing concentrations of copper and silver and clams collected on a mud flat in the South Bay. And you can see that oxygen concentrations have gone up, metal concentrations in clams have gone down. And so this is a success story in environmental, uh, in environmental management. And in this case, the problem was basically one of treating sewage to a, to a more efficient degree to remove biological oxygen demand and metals that were built, uh, that, that were um, discharged in the wastewater effluent. So there are three attributes of this kind of problem that we have solved successfully. Um, one is that we understand the problem well. Secondly, this is a local scale problem. And, and thirdly, um, there's one single factor that underlines the problem. So just a reminder that we do know how to solve some environmental problems. Now, this is a different this is a different kind of problem. The Delta problem, and it's, you know, the, the, the icons that we use to express indicators of the Delta problem are these population declines of a number of species of fish. But the Delta problem, I don't think, is really a fish population problem. I think it's an ecosystem problem. And these downward trajectories are indicators that the carrying capacity of the ecosystem to support these uh, fish has diminished greatly. So. In my mind, the delta problem is what are the underlying causes that have caused the ecosystem to reduce its carrying capacity for organisms that we want to sustain? And what steps can we take to reverse those trends? And this is an enormously difficult problem. And um, it's much harder than the, the problem that, that, I, that I began with. And um, John Bureau gave some really nice examples of why this is a complex problem. And I'd just like to suggest six other reasons why this, the Delta problem is a hard problem to make progress on. So the first problem is that, as you all know, this is not a single factor problem. This is a multi-factor multi problem. And if we, if we just step back and look at the ways in which human actions have transformed the Delta, it really is remarkable. Uh, we've completely transformed the landscape. We've enriched the estuary with nitrogen and phosphorus. We've introduced to the Bay Delta 100 species of invasive plants and animals. We've greatly modified sediment supply to the estuary. Uh, we've altered the, the quantity and timing of freshwater inflow with effects on circulation in the Delta. And Val is going to Val Connor, Connor is going to talk about uh, results of assays showing uh, effects of uh, uh, toxic contaminants on the estuary. When Sam Luoma was the the lead scientist for the Fed Bay Delta Science Program, he talked about grand challenges. And in my mind, the ultimate grand challenge is for us to understand how these different disturbances to the ecosystem work in synergy to reduce the carrying capacity of organisms that we're trying to protect um, and, 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 and amplify their populations. The second reason is that this is not a local scale problem in any sense. I mean, John talked about how regional, regional consequences of, of local effects. This is kind of a schematic about how, of, of how the Cascade Project works. And it begins with outputs of global circulation models because we know that the Bay Delta system responds to global scale uh, 
climatic processes. We downscale to the region of California, so we need to, we need to look at how global scale processes bring about regional effects. And we, and we downscale even further, and we want to know how regional effects at the scale of California have effects on, on the delta. And so this is a complex problem in the sense that we have to take a broad geographic view of the delta, looking far inland to the crest of the Sierras and, and across the North Pacific Ocean. Um, and a corollary, the world does not end at Cartina Strait. And here's an example of why the world doesn't end at Cartina Strait. These are new data. The, uh, the y-axis represents the position in the estuary where samples were taken, Sassoon Bay, San Pablo Bay, Central Bay, South Bay, Lower South Bay. The, the, the x-axis is time. These are samples collected over a three-year period. And the size of the circles is an index of the concentration of microcystin in those samples. And the, the circles that have numbers in them are concentrations of microcystin that give us reasons to be concerned about this. Now, as far as we know, microcystin, uh, it, it, we know that microcystin is produced by the cyanobacterial uh, microcystis in, that develops blooms in the delta. As far as we know, microcystis does not grow in the bay. So it, it looks like blooms of cyanobacteria that are producing microcystin in the delta uh, are having a downstream effect. The microcystis measured in the bay likely originated to uh, in, in the delta. So it's just a reminder that, that uh, uh, events that develop in the delta can have downstream effects. And this is part of this concept of local, regional, and, and global scale. The third, uh, the third reason why this is a really hard problem is that estuaries are situated at the interface between oceans and land. And when we think about climate variability and its effects on the bay delta system, we have to remember that the climate system operates on very different kinds of processes over ocean basins than it does over watersheds. So an index of oceanic uh, uh, responses to climate variability, this is, a, th th this is an annual, this is a time series of annual uh, uh, values of the North Pacific gyre oscillation, one of the important modes of uh, atmospheric forcing across the North Pacific that has a big effect on the Bay Delta system. And this is a time series of outflow which is another representation of a different kind of climatic process. This is precipitation and, and runoff over the watershed. And if you do a cross-correlation analysis of these two time series, they are completely unrelated at, at, any, at any lab. So this is evidence that there are separate processes of climate variability operating over ocean basins from those operating over watersheds. Estuaries are situated at the interface between them, and we need to take both of them into account. So I don't know if you can see this table. It's an extract from a table in a paper that Fred Fire has just submitted for publication. And uh, he has identified uh, some groups of, of fish, demersal fish, um, like English sole and white croaker, <coughs> that have either positive or negative associations with the North Pacific gyre oscillation, this large scale climate process. There are pelagic <coughs> fish like northern anchovies and Pacific heron, whose annual population fluctuations are also tied to this climate index over the North Pacific. And then there are other species of fish like Pacific staghorn sculpin and speckled sand dab and pelagic fish like longfin smelt and striped bass that have associations with delta outflow. The point is that, is that organisms that use the estuary have a range of life histories. Some of them track climatic processes over ocean basins. Some of them track climatic processes over the watershed. In terms of understanding the complexity of the estuary, we need to, we need to consider both. The uh, forest is what I call the breathtaking pace of change that takes place in estuaries, and the delta in particular. Um, this is a, a summary graph from a paper published by Monica Linder and Alan Jaspi, um, and it shows this remarkable restructuring of copepod communities in the low salinity part of the estuary. In a matter of, in a matter of years, the, the uh, copepod community was restructured. Restructured, And the pace of change in the delta reminds us of this quote from this landmark paper of Peter Batista. We're changing the earth more rapidly than we're understanding it. And that is certainly true of the delta. It's an enormous challenge for those who are, who are trying to keep up with the changes in the estuary. Um, and then to, to layer on top of that, uh, change doesn't let up. The, the Bay Delta system is in a continuing state 
of change. I once had a director of the USGS ask me, Jim, haven't you studied the San Francisco Bay long enough? Haven't you got this figured out yet? And my answer was, you know, we can stop sampling in the Bay after it stops changing, but it hasn't stopped, stopped changing. Um, so the Bay Delta system that exists today is in some ways unrecognizable from the Bay Delta system that I started studying in 1976. And in the next 38 years, the Bay Delta system is going to be transformed beyond probably our imagination. We need to keep up with this. And lastly, estuarine ecosystems have dynamics that are complex and nonlinear. And I want to give you one example uh, from a paper. And this paper is about the problem of eutrophication. So these are measurements made over a period of decades in four different estuaries in Europe. And the insets of each of these show a period of increasing nitrogen input followed by a period of decreasing nitrogen input. The problem is that we enrich these estuaries so much that we produce excess phytoplankton biomass that led to hypoxia and all the other problems. And so policies were implemented to reduce nitrogen loadings to all four of these estuaries. Now, the hope and expectation was that as we know that as we increase nutrient loading, phytoplankton biomass as chlorophyll went up, and we hoped and expected that if we reduce nutrient loadings that they would retrace that same trajectory. But the, 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 I don't know if you can see these red points here, but these are measured trajectories, and none of them follow the trajectory of, of enrichment. And the authors uh, suggested a number of possible explanations of what they mean by complex nonlinear dynamics. One is that, is that we recognize that sometimes we have to cross a threshold or a tipping point before changes actually take hold in these complex e ecosystems. The other is that as we reduce nutrient inputs, we end up at a different place in terms of phytoplankton biomass than where we started. And they describe this as a re regime shift. In both cases, what this means is that the efficiency of the estuary of converting nutrients into phytoplankton biomass increase. And, and we can expect really complex processes that involve interactions between regime shifts and, and, um, and shifting baselines. Um, so if we were in Boston, we would call this a wicked hard problem. And um, here are six reasons why this is a wicked hard problem. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any clarifying questions from the panel members? A lot to digest there. We'll move ahead. And so the next speaker is Dr. Wim Kimura from uh, Lombard Tiburon Center to talk a little about food webs. I'll try not to be quite such a downer. <laughs> um, and I, I'm also, this, the structure of this talk is going to be very nonlinear in contrast to the content. Sorry, it's going to be very linear. Uh, I'm following my directions here. So first, illustrations of complexity, conflicts and contradictions, what we've learned. So just thinking about the delta, and I, I agree with Jim. I don't like to focus on the delta alone. It's not really separate for the, for the organisms that live there or for the water. Um, but in the delta, we've got some something like 170, or in the, in the estuary, actually. We've got something like 170 fish species, 70 zooplankton species, bunch of other things. And here's, here's a recent finding by uh, Tim Otten from, uh, formerly of uh, North Carolina, University of North Carolina, uh, working on microcystis with us. And he did a whole genome uh, profile and you know, a quick profile of, of just what was in the water, uh, what, what particles were in 200 milliliters of water. And he found in areas not of microcystis, he found 1,300 genera, or effectively genera. Um, so what are all those things doing? We have no idea. Um, now, we, we think of systems, we think of complexity, you know, a complex system as being like the, the weather. Okay, so the, the, the weather in, you know, we, we know about these, these atmospheric rivers being very hard to predict and hard to figure out. and and uh, we don't know if we're going to get another one this year or we're going to have to wait several years for them. We, we do know that they're a big deal for our hydrology. But these are very complicated, complex, um, you know, physical systems. Uh, similarly, our, uh, our flood and dry, drought cycle, it's not as complex as it used to be, I guess. It seems to be kind of continuous now. But um, 
the upper part of that graph shows the, um, let's see if I can get this pointer to work. Um, the upper part shows the, uh, I think it's the six highest flow years, and, and these are the six lowest flow years. They're on the same scale. So you can really see the interannual and intraannual variability. We all know how this, uh, how this works, and, and you would probably say this is complex, but I'm here to tell you it's, that's a pretty minor part of it. Um, so we've got about 40 fish, fish species and something like maybe 30 or so species of benthic invertebrates and 35 zooplankton species and 50 species of phytoplankton or so. Uh, these are very, very rough numbers. And, you know, thousand-ish microbes. Um, and, and then, well, a species or a population of a species is a human construct. If you go out, if you think about what's going on in the water, they're not all interacting with each other. It's individuals interacting with individuals. So we have to think about how many there are. And there's about just less than a billion fish and a little over a billion benthic organisms and zooplankton and a trillion or so phytoplankton cells. And I don't know what number that's, a godzillion, I guess, um, uh, microbes. So, so this, this is what I would call complex. Um, and it's complex because a lot of those things, they can't, they're not all interacting with each other, but a lot of the individuals in these lists are interacting with a lot of the other individuals, and that's changing over time as they move around and their abundances wax and wane. So when it comes to trying to figure out how this ecosystem works, and we're only scratching the surface by looking at the body count, meaning how many fish there are, we're, we're really missing out. I should remind you that when we also, that when we go out with a bunch of trawls and we catch 25 delta, or so let's say we catch five delta smelt, and some, the next, next time we go out, we catch 10 delta smelt, we say, oh, the delta smelt are going up. No, those are small numbers, they're unreliable. You need hundreds to figure out what's going on. So, so not only are we dealing with a system that's complex by its numbers, we're also dealing with measurement methods that are, are sort of increasing the complexity by their paucity of numbers. So then when you, when you actually begin to get a handle, as we've done on the low salinity zone in this estuary, you, get a, you begin to get a handle on how some aspects, aspects of it work, um, you, can, uh, you can start to see some very weird things going on. So, so this is just a time series, and you've, you've all seen most of these, these lines before. This is grazing by Papamacordula. This is phytoplankton biomass crashing. This is copepod biomass. Jim showed you this before. A decrease, but not as big a decrease. This mystified us for a while. I'm going to explain to you why that happened. Um, mycid biomass crashed. Longfin smelt kind of kind of went down afterwards. And anchovies went way down. Anchovies went down in the low salinity zone. They didn't go down in the estuary as a whole. And, and um, Jim pointed out that they mainly uh, they mainly attuned to um, climate cycles in the ocean. So, um, so why did they go down? Well, the first thing that happened was, I'm, I'm going to show you some, some sort of cause and effect arrows here. So grazing whacked out the phytoplankton and, uh, and some of the zooplankton directly. And the decline in phytoplankton uh, caused a loss of food for the zooplankton, copepods, the mycids, and also the anchovies. And that's why the anchovies left. They basically bailed. They said, you know, this place isn't suitable for us anymore, and they can find better food uh, further down the estuary. So there was a consequence of that. Anchovies previously were the, by far the most abundant uh, fish in the low salinity zone, and they were about, uh, I think, about three quarters of the biomass. So when they left, that changed things. Oh, also we had uh, the, the decrease in in uh, mycids had a big effect on longfin smelt, which feed on mycids as they grow. Um, and so the anchovies, when the anchovies left, they actually sort of opened up a niche for the copepods. And a few <coughs> years later, uh, we had, a, we had the, uh, another a series of introductions that all happened more or less at once. Uh, three species that came in, two of which are very influential in this area. And one of them is, would probably not have been fed upon by, by anchovies. Um, and so there, but, the other one that got introduced is a predator on, on the, the previous uh, numerical dominant there. So we've got this sort of, uh, you know, within the copepod group here, we've got a cause and effect arrow going that away. And 
because the, the, the survivor out of this is mainly unavailable to, to uh, grizzly feeding fish, that had a further uh, depressing effect on the food available to uh, not just the lungfin smelt, but to uh, delta smelt and striped bass and other fish as well. So when you look at this mess, um, I mean, this is largely based on, on, um, on monitoring data, but also on a, a lot of work to try to tease apart and figure out you know, who's food limited and who's not. It turns out that pretty much everybody in this list, uh, except for the phytoplankton, is food limited, and, and some of them severely. So, so it's basically a, a bottom-up limited system, not that every single species in here is, is bottom-up bottom limited itself. So the rest of it I'm just going to list out because it's a little quicker. Um, we, have, we have a lot of uncertainty. We kind of lump everything together in uncertainty uh, regardless of where it comes from. And, and some kinds of uncertainty are different from other kinds. And I'm not going to use the – I got called out for using fancy terms for that that I learned, so I won't. But one kind of uncertainty is um, the system is variable. Like we don't know when the atmospheric river is going to show up at our doorstep. Um, and we're never going to know when, really, uh, more than a few days out. So that's, that's kind of uncertainty we just have to live with and, and learn how to average over or, or deal with in some way. The second kind is we're ignorant, and if we studied more, if we did some more work, we'd figure it out, or we could figure it out. Um, and the third kind is, uh, is that I've got some data, and I show you my data, and you've got some data, you show me yours, and we disagree on what's going on. So the second and third kinds of uncertainty are, at least in theory, amenable to resolution by science. Um, the first one is in a way, but we have, to, we have to be clever about it. So some of the major questions we're not in a very good position to resolve, and it's partly because we haven't taken the time or haven't put the effort in to figure them out. Um, the effect of export pumping on fish populations. Um, I've written a paper on it, a couple papers, been one or two other people have written a few papers on it. But we really don't know what the population level effects of these, these, these pumping, uh, these export losses are. Um, the importance of food limitation, I mentioned that we, we, we think that a lot of things are food limited, but we don't know how much that matters in relation to the other things that are going on. Is that the major cause of the pelagic organism decline, for example? Moving the point of diversion, okay? so. We could solve part of the problem of exports if we could move the, the point of diversion. That's going to do something else to the system. And I think the stuff that John was talking about is going to be key to that. You know, how does, how does the hydrodynamics of the system change? And how does that in turn change where the fish move and how they move and, and, and uh, what else happens? Uh, it's not simple. You can't, uh, you can't sweep it under the rug. Uh, resolving the ammonium question. Uh, there's some of us here who don't think there is an ammonium question, but uh, there must be because people keep talking about it. Um, that, is, that is extremely, it, it's very, very well suited to an experimental approach. We have to do it. It's not cheap. It's not easy, but it can be done. We have to do it. Um, most, of the, most of the data that we have, I call the body count. You know, we have how many fish, how many zooplankton, different species, how, many, uh, you know, how much chlorophyll, how many uh, phytoplankton cells, and so forth. And from that, we as a community are expected to give answers about processing. That doesn't make any sense. You know, um, it's like going, you go to the doctor and you say, oh, I don't feel well, and he takes your height and your weight and says, well, you take these two pills and call me in the morning. Um, we can't do it because we don't know what's going on inside. We need to know what's going on inside. We need to know how these different things interact, how they behave in their environment, um, and, and a whole lot of things that, that we're not getting good information on right now because the only time we get that information is when somebody puts in a proposal, gets some three-year or two-year or one-year funding to go out and do something. Um, and then the final thing I kind of highlighted because I'm, I'm going to come back to it, the value of restored marshes to pelagic fish, um, which is something we need to know and don't. Now we have learned a lot. You know, there's over a thousand publications on this system, so we've learned an awful lot. I um, think we have a better handle on what's going on in the low salinity habitat than we did before. Some of the effects of export pumping we know a little bit about. These information about turbidity and the, the importance of turbidity and controlling where fish are, we don't know the mechanisms, but we know the, we know the link. Um, we've learned to expect surprises. Jim showed some of them. Um, 
And, and we've learned that, that this complex system is not easy to tease apart. It doesn't, it doesn't yield its secrets readily. Um, now, coming back to this, this uh, shallow habitat business, the question is, you know, can restoration reverse some of these declines in the pelagic food web? And I'm emphasizing pelagic because that's open water. So there's two mechanisms. One mechanism would be that the little fish, the delta smelt and so forth, go into the marshes and feed there and get energy from the marsh. And the other, or in the shallow area, and the other mechanism is that this area exports zooplankton. And, and so you can imagine two different you know, extreme scenarios. Along the left is a high production scenario where a lot of stuff leaks out, and then there's a low production scenario where stuff doesn't leak out. And it's not too hard to figure out the conditions that lead to one or the other, but the question is, if you build or rest restore a wetland that doesn't now exist, which kind will it be? Where will it be on that spectrum? And will it really export uh, food for, for pelagic fish? The limited literature on this says it will not. Um, so um, there is uh, one, one thing I want to brag about a little bit at Val's, uh, for Val's behalf. Um, there are now four teams, I, I'm on one of them, that are investigating uh, Cache Slough, the Cache Slough complex, with respect to its ability to produce uh, food for fish. And it's a multidisciplinary, multi-team kind of effort. And the, the nice thing is we're all being encouraged to, part, to uh, collaborate and work together and meet together and talk about our results and compare notes and so forth. And this is a very complicated system and the question we're answering, we're asking is, the questions we're asking are, are, are difficult questions to answer. And so this kind of uh, large scale collaboration I think might be a really effective way of dealing with this stuff. So, that's it. Okay, thank you, Wim. So the last formal presentation in this session is going to be on contaminants and uh, is given by Dr. Val Connor, who's with the Swifka Agency and Science Program. Can folks hear me okay? Arrow to the right makes it more tough, of course. Um, so what do we know? Uh, I'm talking about contaminants. Um, and one of the things that we do know is that contaminants are one of multiple stressors that are impacting the bay and the delta. Uh, there's been a number of syntheses done over the last um, decade, and all of them have concluded that. And most of them have also concluded that if we really want to restore the delta, it's going to require that contaminants are managed. So what else do we know? Uh, we know that we're at high risk for um, <coughs> contaminant um, in, in the, the estuary. Uh, just in the U.S., we've got about 100,000 registered chemicals, 3,000 new ones every year. Um, a number of them are things that we know we're putting into surface water uh, in terms of things that come out through treatment plants like cosmetic ingredients and pharmaceuticals. And then, of course, pesticides we apply in both agricultural and urban areas. So the risk for um, chemicals showing up in surface waters is high. What do we actually know, though, about the Bay Delta? Well, uh, one thing that we know is that some contaminants have been detected and detected at levels that suggest to uh, US EPA and to the water boards that there's a problem. So in terms of chemicals that are on the 303D list, and that's basically shorthand for saying um, these are chemicals that are exceeding what we think are safe levels to have in the system, we know that there's a number of persistent organics. Uh, we know that there are a number of pesticides and that those pesticides are changing over time. We know that we have issues associated with mercury and selenium. And then we also know that a number of times when you go out and collect a sample and you bring it back to the lab and you do a toxicity test, that is you ask fish, invertebrates, and phytoplankton, can you live, grow, and reproduce in this water? Um, often the answer is no. Uh, but we're still not clever enough to figure out exactly what the chemical or chemicals are that are causing that observed toxicity. 303D was last updated in 2010, 
Uh, but since then, we have also learned, and Jim talked a little about it, about cyanotoxins from harmful algal blooms, and those are becoming more common uh, and more um, spatially distributed. And then also, we do know that some of what are called these constituents of emerging concern are being detected. A lot of them are detected in the bay. Um, I think there's good reason to assume that if they're in the bay, they're also in the delta. But we're seeing a number of industrial um, contaminants like flame retardants, uh, personal care products like Tricosan, which is the hand sanitizer, and then pharmaceuticals in terms of birth control, antidepressants, anti-anxiety, non-steroidal, anti-inflammatory things such as ibuprofen, of which my hands are dirty, I um, abuse that drug, and then caffeine. So um, we do know that there are a number of contaminants um, that are at harmful levels, and then we know that there are a number of other contaminants, and the question is, are those levels um, harmful? So, so what don't we know if we know this? And, and the problem is, is that we have a very incomplete picture. And so one of the themes I'm gonna hit repeatedly in my seven minutes is that asking the question, what chemicals are present in the Delta? Um, we don't know. Um, we do not have a monitoring program for the Delta. I am hopeful that the Delta Regional Monitoring Program is gonna start in 2015, and so that this will be a knowledge gap that we'll start to fill. And then how are imp contaminants impacting aquatic life? Um, again, we have special studies, and so we have some very specific examples, but we don't have a contaminant component to IEP. Um, right now, there is almost nothing being funded in terms of contaminant effects, in terms of, of research. So um, this is a quote from Denise Reed after um, the end of the contaminant presentation at the Delta Science Program State Board Workshop. Um, she was, it was on exterior flows, but there was a presentation on contaminants, and Denise can always sum it up in a way that really hurts, and so it was like, so you're telling me there's been little to no progress over the last five years in understanding the role of contaminants. Thank you, Denise. Um, but we do know uh, certain things, um, and what we do know we've learned from special studies. There have been a number of special studies that have been conducted by USGS and, and the water boards, uh, as well as agencies like uh, Regional SAN um, or SWIFTA. And so these are just four very quick examples that I want to give to you that demonstrate, at least we have some lines of evidence um, suggesting contaminants are affecting um, the food web. Um, that we see in the Delta. So we have pesticide monitoring from USGS, toxicity testing, um, going out and actually looking for endocrine disruption, and then um, there's been a lot of work done suggesting that salmon olfaction is disrupted by the presence of contaminants at concentrations that we do see in our system. So what do we know about pesticides? Um, again, USGS, this was Kathy Quibola's group, now Jim Orlando's group. Um, have been trying to stay on top of the, the, the Delta picture for pesticides. In 2010, they looked at pesticide use reports and decided, oh my gosh, there's a whole new suite of pesticides that are being used. Um, they then spent a year trying to develop the techniques to monitor for that new list, and then we worked with them to do a couple of special studies to go out and see whether or not these chemicals were actually detected in the Delta and Sassoon. And yes, in fact, they are. And so the punchline is, is that they found in a couple of different studies anywhere from 18 to 34 pesticides present in the Delta. Um, and they found on average nine pesticides in every sample that they took. The concentrations that they were finding were very low usually, um, not high enough that you would expect that individually they would cause lethality to sensitive species, but definitely complex mixtures. And then they did occasionally find pesticides at levels that did exceed thresholds where we would expect mortality to sensitive forms. So the picture that we're getting from USGS is that there are a lot of pesticides, ones we haven't looked at typically, we've been more focused on the insecticides and now we're starting to see herbicides and fungicides. Um, but we really don't know um, what happens when you add multiple concentrations of pesticides together. Um, we have started looking. Uh, we've started looking in lab toxicity tests. We've also started looking in mesocosms. And uh, unfortunately, this is all unpublished, but I have to say um, it, it's not um, an encouraging story because we are seeing that you see 
um, effects, both the level of phytoplankton and zooplankton, when you add together these mixtures of pesticides, even when they're at concentrations that you would say they're so low, they should not be having an effect um, when they're there singly. Okay, toxicity testing. Just to sort of summarize for folks, I think most people know, but toxicity testing is, is pretty simple. You go out into the field and you collect a water sample, you bring it back into the lab, and in the lab you expose larval fish, zooplankton, and phytoplankton, so three different phyla, um, sort of three different levels of the food web, and also you expose them during the critical life stage when they're most sensitive to contaminants, and you just ask them the question, can you live in this water, can you grow in this water, can you reproduce in this water? And so we've been doing this now for 25 years, and looking at both what's in the Central Valley, so what's flowing from the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River into the Delta, as well as looking at the Delta and the Bay. And essentially, um, what we can conclude is that um, we all have dirty hands. Um, sources are, of pesticides and contaminants are coming from both point and non-point sources. And the constituents that have been specifically identified are a number of pesticides, diazinon, chlorpyrifos, diuron, pyrethroids, ammonia, not to be confused with ammonium, we're talking about toxicity to fish here, as well as to metals. Um, we are now starting to do toxicity testing and, and the TIE component with ammonium, but that's a story that will be, be coming soon. So we've identified a number of contaminants that we know are bioavailable, at least when you test with these surrogate species in the lab. And then the other very common result is that uh, toxicity was detected, uh, but we don't know what the chemical or chemicals are that are causing that observed response. Okay, um, somebody asked me about evidence of endocrine disruption. Um, this is kind of scary to me because I could only find one study, but it showed that um, we can expect, and in fact we do in the Delta and Sassoon, see both androgenetic and estrogenetic effects. And so um, this is a study done by Suzanne Brander looking at the pesticide bifenthrin um, concentrations um, that we see in the delta um, are often more than one nanogram per liter, but at that level in the lab, she was able to show um, estrogen um, effects, and in fact, more effects when she started looking at the metabolites of that pesticide. She then went out in the field and collected silver sides. Um, silver sides are kind of neat because they stay near the location um, where they're collected, so she was looking downstream from treatment plants and also from non-point source from cattle ranches. And in fact, downstream from these cattle ranches, she was able to show the masculinization, sort of reduced gonad size um, and a 30% reduction in infertilized egg output. So in the one time when we've looked, um, we found problems. Okay, another example, um, was looking actually in detail at the contaminant effects on cell monads. Um, and one of the things that was examined, um, a number of pesticides have been looked at, but copper is one of the most widely used pesticides in the Central Valley. Uh, it's very common in both urban runoff um, and mining waste and um, also agricultural runoff. And what's been found is that copper um, it's actually an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor um, in, in rainbow trout. It disrupts the olfactory receptor um, neurons and impacts lateral line, the mechanosensory um, neurons. And so it is disrupting um, fish behavior in that they don't smell or detect predators, so they don't have their predator avoidance response. Um, they also um, tend to be able to um, avoid high levels of contaminants, but if you knock out their ability to do that, then they don't have the contaminant avoidance. And then again, there's been changes in their ability to swim. So we've seen reduced growth and survivability and reproduction in both Chinook and, and rainbow trout. And again, at levels that we see uh, in the watersheds in the Delta. So those were sort of four quick examples. Um, uh, getting to the question of what our challenges are, with contaminants, there's a, there's a lot of technical challenges. First, there's the ever-increasing number of chemicals. Um, second is that most of those chemicals do not have analytical methods. In fact, it appears that organisms tend to be more sensitive than the existing analytical methods. 
Um, we also have a lack of, of an ambient chemical monitoring program and also looking at biological effects. If you don't look, you're probably not going to find things. So, um, but if we were looking, um, again, there are a lack of water quality objectives, which is essentially what is that safe level? So when do we start seeing an adverse effect? And so if you put this together, there um, is a lack of knowledge of sort of if and how contaminants are affecting key delta species. And this has a, a negative effect on our ability to understand other stressors because there's a real common pattern that I've seen where when folks are doing a study and the result is sort of inconsistent with their conceptual model in terms of what's going on in the food web, instead of saying, well, maybe I need to rethink my conceptual model, it's really handy to say, oh, there must have been a contaminant and we didn't measure those. And so we need to be able to understand contaminants if we're going to be able to um, understand some of these other things as well. Okay, in terms of um, scientific uncertainties or, or areas of conflict, um, I, I think that there's there's a couple. One is is what I've said here is the appropriate water quality objective. So what is that limit, that regulatory benchmark, and how do we set that so that it's protective but not overprotective? Um, there is a lot of debate about that because there's a lot of uncertainty uh, in in defining that. And then I think the other major um, area of controversy is is how do we actually interpret these toxicity tests and these laboratory studies? So if you see a genetic level response, what does that mean in terms of population level effects? Or if you see a behavioral change that a fish might be more uh, vulnerable to predation or doesn't seem to be able to use its olfactory cues, again, um, wh what does that mean in terms of population level effects? And one of the things that we have seen with toxicity testing is that the toxicity is usually transient. It's not that it's there all the time, but you have pulses that move through the system. And so again, trying to understand population level effects um, has been um, a challenge. So future challenges. Um, one of the things we should have learned, but it appears we haven't, is um, how to handle pesticide problems. Um, we've gone through five switches of pesticides um, in, I don't want to say this, but 30 years. Of, I've been doing toxicity testing. So we had organochlorines, then we went to one type of organophosphate, then to another type of organophosphate, then to one type of pyrethroids, then to a second type of pyrethroids. And so what we seem to do is we identify that there is a pesticide problem, and then we switch to a different type of pesticide um, that is even more difficult to measure because you can use even smaller amounts and it's toxic in even you know, lower parts per trillion. And so until we figure out how we are going to be able to effectively use pesticides and prevent off-site movement, um, we're going to have a pesticide problem. Um, the grand challenges um, that Sam has identified, um, climate change, population growth, hydrology changes, um, and tidal marsh restoration, all of those can be imagined to have an effect on contaminants and contaminant effects. When you change hydrology, you change dilution. When you change um, temperature, you change the kinetics of, of any chemical reaction that involves contaminants. Um, we're going to have population growth. Theoretically, that could lead to in increased loads, although we are getting more effective in trying to reduce off-site <coughs> movement of contaminants. And then, of course, any hydrology change, you're going to be changing loads and concentrations. And then I think most people are familiar with it, so I didn't spend time on it, is that there's a real question related to tidal marsh restoration and whether or not we're going to be creating or exacerbating a mercury problem by basically making a, um, sites that are good at generating methylmercury that then can accumulate through the food web. Um, so that's all I had to say. I just wanted to end uh, with, with a quote, and this is from, from Tracy Collier, who's the chair of the Independent Science Board. Um, he's been working with us to try and summarize what it is we, we do know about contaminants. And so this um, is a long way to say that there are a lot of chemicals out there. We're not really looking at them. Um, we're not really looking at their sublethal effects. And we really need to do that if we really hope to be able to manage contaminants more effectively. Well, thanks, Val. Any clarifying questions from the panel? And I'd just like to add, and you can see on the table here, uh, Anka Mula Soda, who you particularly requested to be here, 
Um, she was the IEP lead scientist. She's now with USGS, so uh, we didn't want to burden Uncle with a presentation, but she's here to answer questions um, you, as you had requested. So why don't we just open the floor to the panel for questions on this part A. Where do you start? Yeah, Johnny? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, getting back into all this and it's complexity and complex spread, uh, and complex feelings about it all. But some other <laughs> systems uh, have started to understand the complexity by doing kind of large system uh, level experiments. And I'm wondering, can you guys envision those types of experiments. And I'm thinking, say, of the Colorado River, where you know, it's very simple compared to all this. But people want to know how does vegetation change with flow, how does uh, sand accumulation change with flow, and can you affect sediment transport with short you know, bursts of, of water and sediment moving in the system? Um, how do we basically move from this kind of approach of monitoring everything and then trying to figure it out, like Wim was talking about? to developing experiments to get directly at the processes. And you know, is that possible to kind of get to some of the complexity? So you really have answers to the processes, not just continuing to monitor, monitor, and come up with ideas and come up with conceptual models. Um, so I'm kind of interested if you have ideas about that. Yeah, I was going to say, should we start with, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give her a chance to, uh, I'm sure you've got some thoughts on that. Yeah, I wasn't sure what my role was going to be here. <laughs> so anyway, I did, the I, <laughs> I did think about a few things just in case Peter called on me somehow. <laughs> um, but that was actually one thing I had exactly thought about. Actually, what I was really thinking about is that uh, what people often want to know is what's the problem in the delta, as if you know there's this fixed thing, this fixed picture we might have of the delta that's currently incomplete, but if we just added a few more pieces, then we'd have it. And it's obviously this very stationary idea that we often have in mind, and one of you guys talked about this at least, or several perhaps, uh, that it's really a moving target. It's actually a movie, if anything, and not just a picture. Uh, and in order to get with the movie, uh, uh, I was thinking we need to do three things for sure, and two of them came up here a lot. The third is the one you just mentioned. Uh, one is to monitor to understand what we're seeing or to know what, what's going on, what happened in the past. The second is to model what might happen in the future. And the third uh, is then to manipulate, so another M, I worked hard on my M's <laughs> with the movie, uh, to manipulate the system in a way uh, that will tell us more, so in the experimental sense. Obviously, we man manipulate the system all the time except we're not actually looking necessarily to see what we might actually learn from those manipulations that we do. So I'm obviously talking about what's called active adaptive management and those sorts of things. And now your question was, have we done this or are we thinking about this? And it's, by the way, really good to see you back here, Johnny. Um, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we actually have, <laughs> believe it or not, since you were here last, perhaps. Um, uh, not as much. Certainly not as much, by any means not as much, as I'd like us to do it. But we have done some. We've done this with flow. The perhaps most controversial ones of those, uh, thing of those, you're probably familiar still for, with the Renalis Adaptive Management Program. That was one thing on the, in the southern part of the system. Uh, more recently, and perhaps even more controversial, was this thing called FallX2, also known as FLASH. Yeah, never mind. Um, but uh, it was about manipulating outflow, delta outflow into the bay in the fall in order to benefit delta smelt and learn something about why it seems to be that, that uh, if the outflow is higher in the fall, they, they do a little better, and if that's really truly so. So we you know, based this on monitoring that had been done, this whole overall general hypothesis, and then came up with via a conceptual model, lots of hypotheses underneath that, uh, and then uh, try to see what happens once we finally got a higher outflow, which we may or may not ever see again in the fall. <laughs> this year, certainly not. 
uh, but we did have it in 2011, and there is a report that you can check out, and that was reviewed by the Delta Science Programs panel, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, other things we've done that are a bit smaller, uh, one that I'm actually really rather proud of, which is much smaller scale, but is a nice collaborative effort started by the IEP, but then with SWIFTA and with uh, the Sacramento, Sacramento Regional um, Sanitation District, County Sanitation District funding, et cetera, is a on and off treatment of the discharge from this very large Sacramento Regional Wastewater treat, uh, Treatment Plan and then a Lagrangian study that followed the parcels of water uh, down the Sacramento River and into this interesting North Delta area where we have all this, these ideas about restoration. Uh, and just to see what happens, because there are lots of questions regarding the role of ammonium and other things that come out of uh, a sewage treatment plan. And there have been lots of bottle experiments, but it turns out that a bottle won't tell you the whole story about a moving uh, estuary, a highly dynamic moving estuary. So that is this manu manipulation idea at, a, at various scales. And there are other thoughts about uh, manipulating uh, flow through the North Delta coming from the Yolo Bypass or the Sacramento Ship Channel there. You could do something at this uh, 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 boat lock, barge lock that's at the uh, northern end of the ship channel. That's an idea that's being tossed around by DWR and Reclamation, for example, and change the flows in a way that may or may not <laughs> uh, help with uh, productivity issues that we have farther downstream. Anyway, there are all sorts of ideas around. There could, could certainly be more. Um, important is that uh, uh, that there is good conceptual and, if, if possible, numerical modeling to have a good idea of what might happen, which is, of course, then based on, on monitoring information that we've collected in the past, uh, and then be really clear about hypotheses, spell them out, and see if they really have do happen. You know, predictions basically, uh, and if not. Uh, follow up on it again. Uh, another important thing that I thought I should also throw in is just the time scale, and John Bureau uh, talked about this the most, I think. But a lot of the processes that we look at uh, don't happen at monthly or yearly scales. They happen at uh, tidal time scales or uh, you know very high frequency, basically. Uh, and what we've done in the past with monitoring, simply because of technology, of course, uh, has often been at these much slower time scales. Uh, now we have the tools and we are also able to follow, for example, water parcels literally down the river with high fr frequency measurements. We can do this, so we should do this. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Anka. Other panel members want to, or presenters want to weigh in on that question? And if we are running a little short on time, if you could keep your responses fairly, fairly brief, that would be I'll, I'll follow Anka then. <laughs> <laughs> well, just two things. Uh, one is that, that Mike Healy and I were on the ERP Science Board years ago and wrote a whole bunch of stuff about this and really encouraged it. And I think some of it actually did come to fruition or is coming to fruition finally in the Yellow Bypass and maybe Dutch Slough, I'm not sure. Um, the other thing is it, system manip manipulation is what you should do when everything else is exhausted. When you, when you, you can't do anything more with bottle experiments and, and understanding the monitoring. It's so expensive. I guess. So, do you think you're there now? Uh, in well, in the, in cases like like the one Anka mentioned, um, where you know the bottle experiments tell you something, and 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 you can do an experiment with the the whole system. Um, yeah, I, yeah, we are. The pressing things. If not, let's go to another question. Yeah, should we go, Sam, and then come back down? To the line. This is even more a difficult, wicked question. But we were asked to solve this question, so I'd like to hear a, a couple of things from just short answers from each of you. We were asked, how do you organize this information? There's a lot of information here. There are a lot of unknowns. There are a lot of things we do know. I think we heard mostly about why it's so complex, which is what we asked you. But what are the secrets? Are there any secrets to organizing this information in ways that, that we can translate it to policymakers? Now, I made the, the suggestion Performance measures that might be something that uh, that policymakers could follow, but especially Greg, as, as a person who's kind of worked at the interface here, but everybody else, are there are there ways that we can do a better job of organizing this information so 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 people who you know, on the state board and things can get at what they need more quickly? I, let me let me start off as this is something I uh, at the conclusion of the uh, Delta Accord, uh, there was a lot of momentum and. and blunted a pick 
trying to get this going. Uh, and it, there's just a lot of resistance within agencies to putting the funds with that. If you, one of the things, we take an, an enormous amount of data and it ends up uh, now on computers at the time it was in boxes. Uh, and there is no systematic group or groups within agencies whose only job is essentially do research for that data, go through it and, and make some sense of it. Too often it just gets forgotten, uh, it, it gets pushed aside. And it's not until someone really has uh, the time and the ability, which is rare, uh, to go dig it out and see if they can make some sense of it. It's just something that, uh, it's a failure on our own part uh, to not have done this 20 or 30 years ago. That when, you, when you put together the monitoring programs to put together uh, essentially the kind of things that they do have at the USGS where people can essentially do research uh, in addition to the other things that are going on, but let them focus on the research and, and get, uh, get some advances. But it's just a shame that, that, uh, that we have never in any of the agencies really put that emphasis. It's n in the long term, it's not that expensive. It's a group of five or ten people in, in each agency. Plenty of other things going on, but if they had that group on there to just look at the data and just try to make sense out of it, we'd have been a lot better off than we are now. Okay, and Flynn, do you want to add to that? Yeah, a, a little short one. Um, well, Sam, you might have been a little depressed to hear that because you went, you know, when you were on the SAG, you were dealing with that very question, and we, we haven't got very far beyond that. Uh, question of how to, how to get knowledge out of monitoring data. Um, I mentioned that we have something like over a thousand publications on this estuary. A new publication comes out and the author sends it around to a few people and it gets out. Nobody knows all those papers. There's no, there's no repository, there's no place to put them, there's no list. We need, we need some kind of a big bibliography of the whole system and uh, those of you familiar with the Coastal and Estuary Research Federation uh, know that uh, they have a, a Coastal and Estuary Research News in which they, they highlight articles in their journal and explain them in plain English, what they mean to, what they might mean to people. If we had those two things, it would make a hell of a lot of difference in terms of people knowing what knowledge is out there and what's available. Which way? Any of the other presenters want to say? If not, we'll go to the next question. So, Mike. Um, so I'm, I'm struggling with, well, first of all, you know that our task is to try to write some short, pithy description of the complexity of the Delta so that people in Washington will jump up and go and pocket some money at you. I'm not sure, Mike, do you think you can uh, talk a little more into the mic? I'm not sure it's picking up. Out of pockets or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, not those out of pockets, no. Um, so I'm struggling a bit with scale. You know, uh, John was talking about how with hydronaut dynamic models we can get down to minutes and seconds and see all sorts of interesting things going on. And oh my God, we should do the biology the same way, um, but that's really difficult. And other presentations have looked at different kinds of geographic and time scales as uh, ways to uh, conceive of things that are going on in the delta. Uh, I don't think that it's going to be feasible to cover off all possible scales. So I'm just wanting to get some impression from the panel that if, if you had to fix on one or two scales to uh, make some points about complexity in the delta, what would those be? Hmm. Who would like to start with that? Jim? I think one or two good examples of why it's important when we think about the delta as a place a couple of examples explaining why, in order to understand what the delta is as a place, you need to know what's going on in the watershed for the crest of the Sierras. Uh, you need to know what's going on uh, in, in the local landscape, thinking about point source discharges. You need to know what's going on in the downstream bay, and you need to know what's going on in the Gulf of Farallon. So, you know, I think this, um, this spectrum of spatial scales that you need to consider to understand the delta as a place is a really important concept. Greg, do you have something to add? Yeah, to I would say that you, you, you need to go down to the small scales, which you need as well. Uh, you need to understand things that are going on uh, biologically from the phytoplankton on up. So it, 
the scale problem is is enormous. It's basically the length of California on one end and it down in millimeter size on the other end. Yeah. And the trouble is, and this is the point of my talk, is that you sometimes have to sample at very high frequencies to get these longer term yes. scales that people want to know because the high frequency stuff gets in the way. You turn to Chabelle or Anka, do you have Just really briefly, I, I think you can actually use it to organize a lot of your information uh, as an organizing principle. In fact, that's what we just did with a report that came out this year, I think, about Delta Smell conceptual model. It was totally explicitly uh, organized by both spatial and temporal scale components. So um, obviously you have to cover it. I do think that what Jim said with examples then, a few since you have to be short, um, you, you'd get pretty far. Well, do you want to add anything or no? Okay, perhaps we'll go to the next session, Cliff, and then Sam. And by the way, we did start a little bit late, so I intend to run over the session just a little bit. So I, I'm always impressed with the wealth of data that you all bring to the table when you present to me uh, and to our group. But the one thing that I've always uh, wanted to get better information on is uh, the issue of data synthesis and integration. And data synthesis and integration, <coughs> I've been part of the Long-Term Ecological Research Network in the United States since my graduate school days. And they've invested a lot in data management so that that data is available for synthesis and integration. And it seems like this system hasn't been effective in getting that data management to that same level. And I was wondering if you have ideas on how to get data management up to the next level so you can do the synthesis and integration more <laughs> Actually, in the last few months, a lot of attention has been focused on that, and you're probably aware that as part of the development of the Delta Science Plan, one of the key things that came out from the broad science community is we really need to take a hard look at that. If we're going to address the concerns that the National Academy were very articulate about, we need to be better than that. So there is a uh, a white paper that was developed as a result of the data, a big data summit last summer that's actually open for public comment now. Uh, it's likely to go through some pretty major revisions, I think, based on some of the public comment we've received. But that is really the, the starting point. What do we need to create a common uh, foundation that, you know, that, that agencies, NGOs, water contractors uh, can all buy into? So I would certainly encourage you maybe to take a, a look at that. It was a pretty major undertaking. Uh, was it two or three hundred people there live, well over a thousand people participating online. So, so a lot of thinking went into that document. But uh, does any of the presenters here want to add to that and um, fell some of the activities? I, I think that we're, we're starting to make progress. I mean, there was legislation in SB 1070 that created the Monitoring Council, and so there are, are work groups that are focused on pulling data together to answer very specific questions. And so within the Delta, um, we're essentially developing web services to pull from the larger IEP databases so that that information will be available for folks to look at um, some of the things that used to be just paper reports, like the, the D1641 water quality conditions report, um, was just paper, and you could just kind of look at the figure, and you could see phosphorus at one site for, you know, 12 months, but you certainly couldn't look at the relationship between phosphorus trends over time, or you certainly couldn't look at the relationship between phosphorus levels and, and, and phytoplankton or something like that. Um, that is now actually all available online, and it has... Um, some pretty simple query tools so that you can look at it. Um, but there is a lot um, that still needs to be done. Um, if you look at just the IEP budget and how much is that routine monitoring versus the special studies, uh, we have to start capturing that special studies um, component. And um, I, I'm, I'm an advocate of, of tough love. If, if you want to take state money, um, you need to tell us um, where your data is going to be so that we can take a look at it. And um, if you can't do that in a reasonable amount of time, then don't come back for, for our state money. And we tried that at the water board and it was incredibly effective within a short period of time um, from taking regional boards that uh, just wanted to be out in the field collecting data, not really um, managing it or assessing it. 
to doing that in, in, in close to real time. So I think we are making progress, um, but I think we have to um, have some guidance in place on, on what the expectations are, and then we have to um, enforce that. Thanks, Mel. And Jim, you were going to add? Um, yeah, Peter, maybe you want to say a few words about, and this is in response to your question, Cliff, about um, the word synthesis. I mean, there are, synthetic activities are highlighted in the, in the Delta Science Plan. I, I don't think we invest nearly enough resources in synthetic science. And um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the tools that we can use to tear apart the complexity of, of the system. So I don't know if you want to say anything specifically about what your vision for synthetic activities in the Delta Science Plan is. But. Uh, actually, Jim, I think you captured it very well. And I, I would just encourage you, I think probably all the lead scientists have seen the mechanisms identified in the science plan. The question is, do there needs to be resources to make, it, to make that happen. Um, so maybe we'll leave that there just so we can take a couple more questions. Um, if there are any questions from the, yes, Sam? I'll well, try with the, the, the unanswerable questions again. I think mainly because you guys have done such a great job, indeed, in, in addressing the questions that we asked. Why is this way? What, where are the elements of complexity here? Why is this so complicated? I think one thing that could, one message that maybe doesn't come across to the stranger that we have to be able to figure out across is, is where what we know, because we do know a lot, and, and how this builds from there. But if there's one place that we, or a couple places we need to go, well, first of all, I'd like to see Chris to ask, <coughs> excuse me, is this more complicated than other places? The number you put in other places. No. Good. <coughs> so, so San Francisco Bay is not unique in that respect. I, I don't think so. I think, it, I think the delta is unique maybe in terms of the magnitude of which it's been transformed. It's kind of hard on the planet to find a place that's been transformed as much by so many different activities, but this inter the, the, the need to understand how climate variability <coughs> interacts with landscape transformations, with introduced species, with nutrient enrichment, toxic contaminants, that's a universal problem in, in coastal ecosystems. And um, I always think that California is you know, a place of innovation, and um, there aren't great templates that we can follow to, uh, to, to tear apart the complexity of a place like the Bay Delta system. And, um, but we know tools that we can use, like syntheses of existing data, doing manipulations, doing controlled experiments to get at these interactions, doing, uh, launching the appropriate kinds of, of models. Um, the, the essential problem is that we haven't found the resources to do what it takes to tear this problem apart. So I don't think the complexity of the problem is unique here. Um, and you know, oftentimes when we hear the word challenge, we, it's followed by the word opportunity. And um, we've got an opportunity here to, to try, try to muster the resources to seriously move forward in unraveling the complexity of this plan. And, and that, I think, is reflected in the Delta Science Plan. Can I say something here? Yeah, please. I, I think we should take comfort from the fact that we still have a Delta. <laughs> <laughs> There are lots of other former large river deltas, Osaka, Shanghai, that there's the odd channel still there, but there's nothing that looks like a delta anymore. So it's not complete transformation, but it's pretty serious transformation. Anybody else about whether this is, does everybody agree that this isn't any more complex than anywhere else? About half. I think it, it, you know, we have all the elements, you know, in an estuary. We have, we just have more of it. We have more, you know, it's, you know, this system is pretty hydrodynamically reticulate. We've got more invasive or introduced species than almost anywhere else, or anywhere else perhaps. Um, you know, so we, we seem to have, we have all these problems stacked up on top of each other. We've got urban sprawl, we've got agriculture all over the place and all the chemicals that come with each. So um, I, it's not qualitatively different from other places, it's quantitatively different. That's it. I'd like to just sort of pursue Sam's comment now a little bit because I think it's important. The physical process, what's going on in the invasive species, the stresses are similar, but in this system it just seems 
that often in these other countries, there'll be one overarching agency with an, an overarching mission and there's probably one or two factors that are driving the decision-making process. And, and it just seems here that what's different here, there's what, over 230 agencies with, with some interest in the Delta, and you're trying to manage the system for multiple objectives with agencies that have a mission that doesn't cover everything. And I just wondered from your international experience and national experiences, isn't that a big part of the complexity within our system here? It doesn't cross any borders, no international borders. There's no transboundary <laughs> stuff, no, that's true. Yeah, I, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was thinking about the Baltic, it's owned by nine, nine countries, yeah. and it's got interactive effects of fishing closely in each human enrichment, habitat transformation. I wonder, how do they develop management plans for the Baltic when there are nine individual countries here? Yeah. Actually, we'll just see if there's any other. Actually, questions. I do have something to add, but you yeah. also said. No, 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 we'll, we'll do that when we wrap up the session. But if you'd just like to respond to the question, that would be great. Uh, okay. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't think ecologically this is particularly unique. Estuaries are complex, and we have one of those. But what I do think is what we just talked about a little bit. Uh, what's really unique is that we have this estuary, an estuary as the hub of a huge water infrastructure for the most populous state in the nation. And that most populous state isn't just a state unto itself, but rather it's connected to lots of other states and countries by way of the products that are produced by way of the water that's going through the delta. So that uh, means that there are a ton of state ho stakeholders from the local to the international that have some sort of a stake in this here delta. And that is a delta, you know, <laughs> that is, you know, obviously a complex ecosystem, but on top of it socially and eco economically hugely complex. And then there's also this fragmentation in terms of who has a say over all of this. Uh, and, you know, the governance that's always talked about uh, and how we, how we come to some kind of a management uh, strategy that works for many, if not most. So in that sense, I think it's actually quite unique. And, and on top of it, one, one more thing, it's not just uh, the most populous state in, in this nation and the economic powerhouse, obviously, but also one with this incredibly uniquely variable climate. Okay, Mediterranean climates occur in other places too, but they aren't all as populated as this state here is or as economically powerful as this state here is. So I think that, that definitely adds complications, if not complexity. Thanks, Anka. I think that really does bring the end of this, of this session, but I just wondered if you've heard the discussion, Anka, I was going to ask you just to see, was there anything missed um, from your fellow presenters that you would like to missed make? Missed by these guys? <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. This is a wonderful panel here, so no, they didn't particularly miss anything, although Wim at least men mentioned the microbes. I think we should have had a little more of that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> no, I, I don't think they miss too much. I, uh, uh, Peter told me via our little note here that I should somehow wrap this up. Um, and <laughs> and uh, I thought I would reflect this really briefly on something that you guys just brought up and that was then talked about here, uh, which is this uh, analysis, synthesis, using all the data we have to, to turn it into useful information. If we're doing enough of this, or if there's perhaps some other thing that we're not doing enough of, which is actually where I'm trying to get to. I, in my, I was the IEP lead scientist for six years, and one thing I do feel has changed over those six years is that people understand more clearly than ever before how important it is to use our data and analyze it and synthesize it and do it together, do it collaboratively, one delta, one science, as Peter luckily come, came up with in this short form. Uh, I do think that there is general consensus that this is what we need to do and the agencies, some agencies have followed suit and have actually established more positions that are specifically there to look at data and, and, and look at things in a more synthetic way and, and write about them and talk about them. Um, so actually I feel we're at least going in the right direction. I'm certainly not saying we're there, <laughs> but we're going in the right direction. One thing I feel, however, that we're still falling short on big time is this 
active adaptive management or any sort of real experimentation, even with the regular normal kinds of management actions that we're already doing, to really follow up on what we think might be happening when we do these things in a much more systematic way and uh, form hypotheses, do the modeling, form hypotheses and, and come up with predictions and then see if these things are really happening or not. And also, not just in a short-term sort of sense every day, but also long-term, given what we know will likely happen, might happen with climate change. This has been done in, in special study sorts of ways. For example, Jim Clarn's uh, Cascade Project here. Uh, but we could do a much better job, in my opinion, to uh, doing this much more systematically and there needs to be more buy-in. This is really hard because you're not then talking about dealing with a resource that so many people depend on so much. So it's economically a really tough thing. But uh, in order to really learn and answer some of these tough questions that I'm sure you all will lay out very beautifully, <laughs> I think the only way is to really be, get serious and do some of these manipulations in a way that will hopefully help us understand the system better. And it's an ecosystem not just some fish species. Great. Thank you, Anka. As always, a nice summary. <laughs> okay, well, I'd just like to thank all of the presenters for, for coming up and uh, in a couple of cases for changing plans to be here. We really appreciate that. And we're going to make a quick transfer here to the panel 3B, the second half of the ecosystem, which will be on birds and fish and habitat. And we'll take a break after this next session. <laughs>